and welcome to the Doofcast, the official variety podcast of doofmedia.com. My name is Scott Daly, and I'll be recording this podcast the normal way. My co-host, Matt Freeman, will be recording it in reverse, and then we'll meet in the middle. First question, did you want? What? Hail and just now, but... This week on the show, it's another one of our Deconstructing Director series, Matt. I'm very excited about this. We get to do just one of these a month now, but I love doing them. Um, so I'm very excited to dive into another film of our uh, spotlight director, David Fincher. This is the seventh film in the series. I can't believe we're already on number seven. I think there are... I, I, don't, I forget how many there are left, but we're on the seventh film in the series. We're talking about 2008's The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. All right. It's going to be an exciting conversation because it's a movie you had never seen before, right? Yeah, it's true. It's I, uh, it may be the only one of his films I haven't seen. I think the only one of his films that I haven't seen is Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Oh, um, oh yeah. So. I, I, that, that'll be fun. You, yeah. A movie that I've <laughs> seen and you haven't? Wow. That yeah. never happens. Yeah. Then after we finish talking about Benjamin Button, the cinema wars have officially begun, Matt. It's crazy out there. With companies declaring war on each other left and right, we're going to break down the news and talk about what's going on in the world of theater exhibition <laughs> movies. It, it could be coming to an end. We don't know. It's crazy. It's it, just madness. It really is wild. I can't wait to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's our show. Uh, enjoy it. Wow. That wasn't good. <laughs> It, spoilers for Benjamin Button, by the way. Uh -huh. Spoilers for Benjamin Button. Go watch that movie. Come back. Talk to us about it. But let's just jump right into it and let's talk about the curious case of Benjamin Button. My name is Benjamin Button, and I was born under unusual circumstances. While everybody else was aging, I was getting younger, all alone. Matt, what is this movie about? Uh, the Curious Case of Benjamin Button tells the story of Benjamin Button, a man who starts aging backwards with consequences. There are those, definitely. Yep, thanks, IMDb. That was useful. This movie was written by Eli Roth based on a short story by F. Scott Fitzgerald, which itself, I believe, was based on a quote from Mark Twain about how um, basically that the, the youth is wasted on the young or something like that. Um, so it's just the, the concept of aging backwards mean at your wisest and most worldly, you would have the body to appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and so that's the basic concept of this movie, but this is a movie not, I mean, it is about that, but it's a movie about dying. It's a movie about living. It's a movie about life and loss and existence. Um, it's a long movie. <laughs> it is two hours and 45 minutes long. Um, I believe that makes it the longest movie David Fincher has ever done. Uh, Zodiac was a pretty long movie, but I don't think it got quite up to 245, even the, uh, even the director's cut. Um, yeah, uh, it is a long movie. It feels every minute of its length. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be too thoroughly negative, but I, like my maybe unnecessarily reductive summary of the movie is that this is um, a cross between Forrest Gump and the uh, the Fitzgerald short story because this is the same writer as Forrest Gump. Yeah, Eli Roth wrote Forrest Gump as well. It, that is it, correct. It feels a lot like Forrest Gump, but then it also doesn't. And the, the places where it doesn't, I think, are because of David Fincher. Yeah. So uh, that's going to be fun to specifically talk about, I think. I agree. I mean, this is a strange movie. On its own, it's a strange movie. As a directorial choice of David Fincher, it is a strange movie, especially because I think the biggest thing we have to talk about here, Matt, is that this movie is like the exception that makes the rule of David Fincher movies. We've covered seven of his movies now. This one is not like any of the other six. The, I think we could draw a pretty clear line from alien three all the way up to zodiac in the type of things that fincher is interested in the type of characters that he's interested in the type of worlds that he's going to construct and and film similar right yeah. between every single one of these movies similar and we come to this movie and it's completely different it, it, like it's so different like that i, I kind of my goal when i sat down to watch this movie was can i unlock the puzzle of why david fincher looked at this movie and said yes 
And I, I was like waiting for the the genius moment where I'd be like, oh, oh yes, of course, this is a Fincherism. Like this is that's what. And I think it's actually the opposite of that. I think he was drawn to this movie because it is nothing like anything he's ever made before. And I think he like reveled in that challenge a little bit to make something completely different, to make something that told a story that was completely different from the stories he's told that looked completely different. Um, I think you can still kind of see some Fincherisms in his, his directorial style here and there, but like the tone of the movie is totally different. Yeah. Well, I think that the best thing about it is a, is a pure Fincher quality, which is mm. that um, all of the dialogue scenes are just electric and perfect. Yeah, yeah. And and with his classic way of just bringing out the best imaginable performance and and f- shooting it with with uh, kind of a large number of cuts so that you are fault you're rapidly following like the the back and forth of of power and like flickers of subtle emotions on people's faces and um you know like so much of the dialogue is actually not um or rather so much of the communication is actually not dialogue because Benjamin Button is actually a character who's fairly taciturn. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, very often people will be sort of talking at him and, and he'll just kind of be letting it wash over him. Um, and, uh, and so a lot has to be communicated with like, how are they saying it? And it's just really stacked cast. So that really helps. Um, yeah. Just incredibly, like, incredibly talented actors yeah. all across the board on this thing. Yeah. yeah. Just like relatively small roles. Uh, you, you've got like Tilda Swinson in like a really small role that she mm-hmm. just, nails it you're just like oh i just love this little this little vignette i mean what's funny is like that's such a nothing that's that, that's such a pointless meander like like if, if you were talking about story economy and like like propulsive storytelling <laughs> it's just a it's, it's just a meaningless meander that could have been cut out of the story and and quote unquote lost nothing but like that's the thing is that's the kind of story this is this yeah that's is, the whole that's the yeah. whole movie that's the whole movie. yes exactly so i i'm not saying Oh, they should have cut out the boring Tilda Swinson part. I, I I love that part actually. I love I love a lot of these little meanders. I, I love I love the whole beginning of the movie where where he's living in in New Orleans. Um, um, I there's actually there's actually a few parts of the movie that I thought were boring. I think I think the boring parts to me that I just didn't love were like the parts where it's like and then transition. And you're like, sure, oh, okay, sure. like, like you, you, like a lot of, mo- you lose a lot of momentum there, but it's sort of unavoidable yeah. in this kind of movie, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, I think that's the, the crazy thing about this movie is I think each individual scene and moment is brilliant. Um, I think when you stack them together for a uh, hundred and sixty minutes, that's when the movie starts to show itself because it's, it's, it's long. It is, it is a meandering movie. As you said, it does not have a plot. Like there is not a traditional narrative here. There is just, this is the life of this man. This is his life. And we're going to pause at key moments to talk, to really just have key conversations. That's what it is. Like just moments in which like Tilda Swinton's character, her, her role in his life is just I mean, they, they get down too, but their, her role in his life is just someone to talk to and someone to kind of, he's learning about the world. Um, and the irony of course, is that he is, looks like he's like, everyone treats him as if he's world weary because he's old, but he is like young at heart and ignorant of the world. And, and I, I wonder if there's something to the idea of like the way people treat him differently because they see an old wise person who knows all these things they're talking about, whereas they would not have been so open and honest and forthright to a, a young man. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. I mean, I think we can talk you know, specifically about this conceit of the film, the, the sort of fantasy conceit that he's aging in reverse and right. right. And, and, and everything the movie is able to do with that. I definitely think that's in there. Um, that, you know, everyone does treat him radically differently. They, tr- they treat him like, you know, they, they treat his taciturn nature as like, oh, he must just have deep wisdom, you know, still, mm-hmm. still waters yeah. run deep. And it's like, no, he's just he's just 17. Yeah. He doesn't have anything to say. <laughs> um, and and like, I think I think maybe eventually at a certain point it does sort of mature into a kind of well, it's it's actually kind of Forrest Gumpish wisdom where it's like you never know what you're going to get. It's like, yeah, I mean, sure, that that's 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 like banal, but also wisdom at the same time. <laughs> sure. It's, I mean, here's. Uh, I I totally agree with the Forrest Gump comparison, like 100%. And I think knowing that it's the same writer makes it like almost a textual comparison. Yeah. I do think like 
It is very interesting to me. My my thoughts on Forrest Gump have been known before. Uh-huh. One of our very first episode is an episode titled Forrest Gump Sucks, <laughs> in which I explain to you in exquisite detail why I don't like that uh-huh. movie at all. Man, our, our um, brand has changed over time. <laughs> it has very much changed. Uh, I still don't like that movie. Um, I think it's filmmaking wise, it's, it's a great movie. But I think the central message of Forrest Gump is like, don't don't try. Don't try. Just follow orders. Stay in your lane and everything. Everything will work out. Don't do anything. Don't do anything else. And, and I think it's interesting because that is very much a movie of the 90s. And this is very much a movie of 2008 where it is like the the Katrina looms over this movie quite literally. Right. Like yeah. Hurricane Katrina is happening as our characters are reliving the story of Benjamin Button. And so it's a movie kind of about the the cruelty of life, the way in which life is just kind of about losing people, about losing things, about things ending. And one of the things that I think is so fascinating is there's this general idea, this general conceit that if you got to live your life in reverse, a.k.a. if you got to be young at the end of your life versus the beginning of your life, your life would be so much better and so much different. And and that would be like, it's unfair. It's unfair that we have to live the way we do. It's unfair that as we are the wisest and the most aware and the most appreciative of our, our existence, we're also the most decrepit and most unable to do stuff. But I think one of the things this movie says is that like, no, it's not like that, th- that doesn't make you happier and it doesn't make life like so profoundly different. You're still watching people you love die. Yeah. You're still at the end of the day, kind of, um, alone, like you still like uh, the comparison between Daisy's death and Benjamin Button's death in this movie are like, they, they both aged the opposite way, but at the end of the day, they died looking into the eyes of the person that they loved. And that's just like, that's his life. So it doesn't like, I think it's remarkable what his aging in reverse changes, but also remarkable what it doesn't yeah. change. I, I, I want to process something here. Um, because the one the one aspect of the film that I had like a really negative reaction to while watching it is the part where um, he decides he's going to abandon his his wife who he is completely in love with actually mm-hmm. and his and his two year old daughter and I was just like first of all like this just hurts me as a father like I I just I just don't like it um, and and also I'm like I don't buy it like I don't I, I don't know why. Why would he do this? And and then I'm like, okay, like, all right, all right, Matt, calm down. Like, why would he do this? And and this is the thing is like, okay, well, let's 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 consider that this is a guy whose whole life, like, he's sort of traumatized. Like, he, he his, his whole life yeah. has has been from from his youth was just people dying and and be, like becoming decrepit and um and 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 falling apart and and in pain and then dying. Yeah. over and over and over and like he is well acquainted with what uh with what like decline followed by death looks like mm-hmm. and and i think he's so traumatized by it that he's like i just i just can't subject that all upon my family and it's like yeah. it it is actually fool it, it is actually wrong because it it makes it makes about as much sense as like a 35 year old guy being like all right, I have to leave. I have to leave you because I just can't ask you to take care of me as I age. Right. Like I I had a friend in college um, who had a father who had her when he was old. Uh Um, I think he was, I think he was about uh, Benjamin Button's age in this movie. His relative age, I believe is 49. Right. So he's about, he's about, about a little past middle age at this point at, at um, the point when he has when he has the, the daughter child. yeah is that yeah true I, well i think right before he has the daughter is is the scene where he said where kate blanchett says um i'm about 43 you're about 49 we're meeting in the middle um, oh okay i guess they're older than i realized when they had the baby but yeah, yeah they, they were both pretty old when they yeah, had the baby okay. yeah um so yeah so she she had a father so like when she was in college, her father was in his early 70s, which is unusual, but it's not like like the most important time is when you're a child, right? Like yeah. and, and yes, you you as a father want to be able to be there to see your kid get married and, and see your grandkids and all that kind of stuff. But it's not like 
It's not like like he basically what we see in this movie is he really only stops being unable to take care of himself when he hits like like the equivalent of 10 right yeah, like right. we don't like 10 or 11 it, or 12 about that time yeah, i mean it's, like, it seems like he must be about 70 by then right yeah yeah, yeah. So, i i think that's i think the only way that i can kind of be okay with the movie emotionally <laughs> is, is thinking of him as someone who is just so traumatized by the idea of loss that he that he runs away um yeah but like but the problem the problem is I don't know if I fully buy that because um, he he goes off to India and like travels the world. And this is portrayed as being like his uh, eat, pray, love, like fulfilling him, his, his you know, he, he writes her this letter that's like, you can change who you are. You can become someone else. Life has no rules. And it's like, God, what what a bunch of nihilistic, depressing <laughs> shit. You, you abandon your family to go become a parking attendant in India Mm-hmm. Like, like this isn't meaning. Meaning would have been staying behind and taking care of your kid as you fell apart. Meaning sucks sometimes. Like, I, I, I just, I, that's the kind of nihilism that was that I think you reacted negatively to in Forrest Gump, actually. Um, and, sure. And so, like, I'm trying to kind of steel man and like see a good reading I can accept. But the part, the part where it's showing him on his motorcycle, like contentedly riding the countryside, I'm like. This this is awful. This is, te- this is terrible. This guy's this guy's awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wonder. I agree with that. I mean, I found that that whole speech moving. But you're talking about it right now. Like, I think you're right. I mean, I guess the thing is, like, he was a kid that never really got his youth. Mm-hmm. If you know what I mean, yeah. like, he never got that. He never got the mo- like the the time when you would go backpacking across India is in your twenties, right? Like that's when you would do it. Like if, if there was ever a time in your life when you're going to be able to do this thing, that's when you would do it. And he never got that. And I'm not saying that justifies the choice he made. I don't think it does. I actually think he's wrong. And I, and I, I, to leave. And I think the movie kind of shows he's wrong because I think the moment when he comes back as what I'm assuming is 16, when he sees um, his daughter in the dance studio, Uh like it's hard to tell with the, the CG and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit, but I think like she basically says you were right to leave. You were right. He's been a good father. And like they're supposed to be they're not supposed to be. I think the characters want there to be catharsis in that moment where she's like she tells him you were right. Uh, I was wrong. You should have left. This guy's a great father. This was the right decision. And just their eyes don't tell that story. Yeah. Their eyes say that's bullshit on both sides. And so I do think the movie is saying his decision to leave was wrong um i i do agree with you that the argument you're trying to construct about him him being traumatized by death i think if that's what they were going for i think they could have established that a little bit better earlier in the film yeah um because i mean i think it's like objectively true like he he spent his first 17 years of his life surrounded by dying people constantly and he saw more death in his first 10 years than just about anybody sees um, yeah. and not just like, and it, these aren't violent deaths. These are just the end of the road deaths. This is just what happens to you when you age and get old. And I, I think it's caused him to have there, there are good parts and bad parts of it, right? Like it causes you to have this understanding and, and respect for age that I think most young people would not have. Um, but I also think, yeah, it can give you, it could get, get like your understanding of the world is, is only the only part you see is the end of it. And that's, so you don't know, you don't know like what is, what is being young? He never knew that really. Yeah. Yeah, He, his, yeah, his childhood was, was just depressing. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't, I, I, again, I have to undermine my own attempted reading because like the, the, the movie does try to be one of these movies where it's like, well, death is just a part of life. And it's like, (laughs) it's like, yeah okay like like, fine like that that's a certain that's a certain moral and i i i happen to think death is just kind of sucks and i don't like it but but whatever if that's if that's the way the movie wants to go that's that's fine it's one of those movies that can make me temporarily okay with death where i'm like i'm like you know if you've had a good long life and you have you've made a positive impact on the world and and you've got like people who will kind of carry on your 
your your spirit in some in some form then then i can be okay with the idea of death and sure and, and the movie kind of wants you to put put you wants to put you in that space but like then you have the main character run away because he's so he's so uh unable to accept the idea that he's going to be this burden on his family and then like he like he would rather his daughter not know him than subject her to the trauma of his death and it just it doesn't hang together for me i don't think it's consistent well and and he writes her like postcards constantly every every event so like were these things that kate blanchett's daisy like chose not to give to her that's not clear did either. He, yeah. Did he want her to read these <laughs> or is he just saving these? Because where did, did the, were the postcards part of the journal? I don't think they were. I think those were just something that Blanchett was storing. Well, she well, that's the thing is she couldn't have even she she only got the journal after she started caring for him. Right. Which um, was when the daughter was presumably like at college or at something. Co- at yeah. college. I, it must have been in college, like no, no yeah. other way. So um so therefore, yes, she didn't even have the journal. She was just she was just keeping she was just not giving her the, the postcards. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is interesting. Like if, if your whole if your whole move is I need to get away from here now at when she's two years old because I need to get away before she forms a memory of me, then to write her constantly is sure confusing. <sighs> yeah. I, it's got a lot of script problems. I, I think sure. just to, to reiterate everything good about the movie is that like, I guess the movie works at a dialogue level script wise. And then, and then the way the, the way they're acted and shot, it makes it, it makes it good. But yeah. like, th- then you're like, okay, but th- thematically, I don't know what I'm supposed to feel. And that, that's like my, my harshest criticism about it is that for a movie about death and loss and, and, decrepitude and and senility and and all these like heavy sad things i I never got choked up at any point yeah and i i didn't either i I don't know if the movie wants you to like i don't know if the goal of the movie is to get you choked up because you're at the funeral of benjamin button's mother or uh, his found father his his actual father that he finds or any of these things i I don't know if the movie wants you to feel that way i mean it's it's like i i agree with you that the message of the movie is death is a part of life. And I don't know if it's in the saccharine kind of like death is good, actually kind of way. I think it's just like, there's nothing we can do folks. Like this is going to happen to all of us. And I forgot what's the line in the, in the thing. Like you can't fight it. Um, it was, a, I, I liked the quote. There's a lot of good quotes in this movie. Let me see if I can find it here. Sure. Sure. Uh, you could be as mad as a mad dog at the way things went. You could swear, curse the fates, but when it comes to the end, you have to let go. Yeah, there's a lot of sentiments like that 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 they even work for me in the moment, even though I like as a human being don't know if I fully accept them. But like the, the movie works on me in in that way. Mm-hmm. So here, here's a here's just a question. I mean, we're talking about Fincher. Like, has Fincher ever made you get choked up? Ever? No. <laughs> um. And 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 a, a big part of that is probably the movies that he chooses to do, but I also just wonder if like maybe he's just doesn't. I don't want to say he doesn't know how because that's such a condescending statement about a director who I think is like one of the best working directors. But like, isn't it interesting that he? I, I don't think he's ever made me get choked up either. I'm I'm trying to remember. I'm I'm, I'm gonna look at his list of movies and see if I can like maybe remember. One, I mean, we have to, we have time. to say that, that there's, there's not many opportunities in his filmography where you could even be choked up. Like, I don't think anyone's like crying when they see Gwyneth Paltrow's head in the box in seven. I think it's just like horrifying. Like I, I like, I think if there was a movie that is going to make you choked up, it's going to be this one. And I agree with you. I, I did not. And I am a crier. I get emotional like, <laughs> watching films. J- just just for the sake of argument, like the end of the game could have been a tearjerker. Um, the scene where Bob dies or or the end of Fight Club could have mm-hmm. could have had some of that punch to them. You know, the, the end of Panic Room where, where the where, where they realize everything is OK. You could have worked that in there somewhere. I'm, I'm just yeah. I'm just I'm just saying I'm just saying, yes, on the one hand, I agree his movies have been like dark thrillers and, and maybe that maybe you're just not going to be able to make that tone work in those movies. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know exactly what my point is, but it is interesting that exactly as you said, this seems like the movie where 
I, I expected this movie to make me cry and it yeah. did not. Um, to, to speculate on a human being that uh, I, I don't know at all. Uh-huh. Um, I don't think that's an emotion he seems particularly interested in. Uh-huh. Um, I, I think I think this movie, I think he wants you to feel contentment, not like happy uh-huh. tragedy or sad tragedy. I, I think I think the movie wants you to feel like, huh, yeah, OK, OK, OK. Um, yeah, uh-huh. like b- bad stuff, like. It, it, the movie is filled with horrible shit happening constantly, but I, I, I don't think I don't think it's supposed to be like, um, like the the weeping kind of. It just like it, tonally, he's not interested in, yeah. in conveying those emotions at all. I think maybe, um, look, we can talk about the CGI because that's totally related to this. I think part of sure. it, part of it for me, and I think this is just how humans work, is that I I I react. To movies much more strongly when I relate to the character and, and when the actor is is good at, at emoting mm-hmm. um, and Brad Pitt in general and particularly in this role where he's like pseudo CGI just does not really is, does not connect emotionally to, to you the viewer uh, most, most of the time yeah I mean I, I think I think if I think back my favorite parts of the movie are the ones in which Brad Pitt is just being 2008 brad pitt. yeah I, I agree <laughs> just guy guy in his late 30s early 40s brad pitt um where you, you don't have to really do anything to him because that allows you to see the character yeah i mean look i they pushed the envelope and they actually won best special effects the academy award this year so um i think maybe perhaps 12 years ago this was much more impressive but there is definitely a goofiness and an uncanniness to old slash young Benjamin that yeah. really, really did not work on me. Yeah. Um, that, that was distracting in every scene it was in. Like it, it made scenes that I don't think like there were some scenes that are supposed to be goofy and it works. I think there were some scenes that it was not supposed to be goofy and it just kind of looked goofy. Yeah. Like the scene where they have a like, gunfight with the submarine, um, was a great scene and I was so distracted by his like appearance in, in that scene. That one, his, his, that look, I guess that's sixties or fifties look Sure, that almost looked more off putting to me than Than the one that was totally CGI. Like for, for, for whatever reason, like his hair just didn't seem right to me. Yeah. It it was just really off. Right. It's, it's uncanny Valley. It's, it's classic uncanny Valley. It's like, yeah, that's not, that's not quite right. And, and, and thus that's the thing in this scene that I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. when my eyes should not be drawn to that that should just be the person in the scene like that yeah it, it doesn't it doesn't pass your your brain's you know deep yeah. deep circuits and and, yeah. and thus it doesn't work like yeah uh, another choice that we have to blame fincher for here is speaking with with special effects is the fact that they dubbed over all of young daisy's lines with kate blanchett trying to do a voice um, the, and she, you can tell she tried to make her voice like sound like a little girl's yeah. because Elle, Elle Fanning plays the youngest version of Daisy we see. And Elle Fanning's a spectacular actress. She's great. She's an adult now because it's 12 years later and she's been great in a lot of the stuff I've seen her in. Um, she doesn't actually get to be heard in this movie because it's it's Kate Blanchett in every version of Daisy. And like part of me is like, I get why you did this venture. Like we have. The, the two constants in this movie are Daisy and Ben and Benjamin Button is Brad Pitt basically the whole time. Right. Yeah. Like like when he's young to when he's old, even when he starts being played by another kid and the few words that he does say, I think that was dubbed too. I think that was still Brad Pitt. I, th- I think it was. Yeah, I, I get why they did it. But it's another uncanny valley thing. It's like I understand like Kate Blanchett is an incredible actress. Like she's so good and she's wonderful in this movie. I can't wait to really dive into her performance. But she doesn't sound like a six year old kid. Yeah. Even even putting a voice on, she doesn't sound like it. And so the the scene where Daisy and Benjamin are meeting, arguably one of the most important scenes of the early part of the movie, I just distracted by the fact that this voice coming out of this head does not match it doesn't yeah i i i mean this seems like one of the situations where like somebody showed fincher a tech demo and he was like oh 
that's perfect. Mm -hmm. We can do this. And then they like committed to it. And then by the time it was evident that it wasn't like a hundred percent, it was too late. Cause the thing is, it's like, it's like 90%. But the the problem with like, that's why the uncanny Valley is a thing is that, is that we're, we will notice a 1% off, uh, you know, roboticness in, in a, and, and, it's interesting because he he is he's been what I would call like innovative and like responsible with technology in all of his like like Alien Three is very special effects heavy movie yeah works but great that no well, <laughs> well I don't think the well, Alien okay. works in Alien Three actually okay you're I I forgot about certain elements of the film <laughs> yeah no actually this is a perfect yeah, yeah it's funny I I don't know why I even said that the the, the Alien the alien CGI in that film doesn't work at all. But then everything after that I feel works really well. Like Fight Club has a lot of CGI and it's actually the kind where like you literally don't even notice. Um, uh, Panic Room has those like th- those shots that are impossible. Um, like as the camera passes through floors and stuff. Um, so he, he's been really good about using CGI in a way that's seamless. And so, yeah, it is, it is a bit surprising to see this actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, the the truth of filmmaking is sometimes you head down a road and it it's a it's the wrong road, but you're too far down it to to change course. Um, like I, I bet I bet you Fincher looks at the CGI in this movie today, looks at the dubbing over uh, Young Daisy and says that didn't work. But you just get you just you work with what you have, right? There's not unlimited time. There's not unlimited budget. Sometimes you make choices and it's too late to back out of the choices. And um, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it, it is, I do wonder, like, it's hard to put myself back in 2008. Like, there are parts of the CGI baby Benjamin that are impressive. Like, it, it's impressive CGI. It's just not photorealistic impressive CGI. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I guess, you know, I, we've complained a lot about it here. I, it only really broke me out of the movie a few times, but I think sure. a few times is still too many. Sure. Sure. So. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think let's let's kind of talk about about Fincher more specifically in some directorial style here, because I think like it, it's so it's so interesting to me, Matt. This is like this is a big movie. It's like a it's like an epic movie. It's like it's a lifetime spanning movie with like multiple lo- like tons of locations, um, montages. And he's doing he's using all kinds of different fun tricks of of filmmaking, like the, the montage you you hate. The montage of young Brad Pitt going through India is shot like it's not sepia. It's kind of sepia, but it's shot to look like like film like yeah. it's got the li- the film lines but he does the the struck by lightning guy he's got the the really really old school like eight millimeter film um yeah yeah sh- like there's all these like he's he's just it's it's a big 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 movie and he's employing so many different devices not just filming devices like there's montages that uh, one of the i think the the most wonderful bits of filmmaking to me is the the intersecting lives and incidents montage of Daisy's accident with the taxi. Yeah. Which I think is almost, it's almost kind of cheating because the whole premise here is that Benjamin Button has written this down in his journal and there's just no possible way he knows all the details of how everything went wrong to get Daisy in front of that car sure. at that exact second. So it's like the movie's kind of breaking its own rules to build the scene. But I mean, the intent there is look at how just bad shit happens sometimes. Um, yeah, but I think it's just, it's just wonderful filmmaking. Like it's just propulsive. Like I think the use, I, I'm a sucker for voiceover. Maybe that's why I like this movie so much. Cause I just love voiceover and there's so much in it, but there's this voiceover propelling you through this scene. You know, it's leading to something. I think you kind of figure out what it it's leading to before you even get there. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Just really great. You know, something bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I like that sequence a lot. There's a lot of sequences in it where, um, you, you probably wouldn't guess that they were Fincher, uh, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that for sure. Um, he doesn't use any of his like customary, like everything is dirty and shitty, uh, aesthetic. Like, yeah, I, I think, I think Zodiac has already shown that he can, that he doesn't have to do that, that he can, that sure. he can really kind of, 
be like, all right, th- this is where we are. This is the time in, in history we are. And, and you really feel transported to there. And I, that was a fun aspect of it, actually. Um, like old, old timey New Orleans felt just, just right. Um, yeah. More like, like the, the seventies and the eighties felt just right. Present day felt accurate. I mean, I guess it was, it was yeah. 2008, but like, yeah, everything, <laughs> everything, um, everything had that, that, sense like you're watching the film you're like oh yeah this is this was obviously filmed in 1970 um when clearly it was it was just very cleverly done to make it feel that way there's such a warmth to this movie though like like a warmth that no fincher movie has like Mm -hmm. even zodiac i i totally agree with you that the the 1970s san francisco in that movie was just impeccable and wonderful but it still felt cold it felt like like washed out a little bit yeah um this movie doesn't feel that way. Like there, there are, there are, I mean, it goes the gamut. Like there's not just one tone, one color, one emotion throughout the movie. It goes from horrible. Like we have a whole action scene, um, with the, the world war two scene. It goes to these beautiful, like sweeping shots of, of like Kate Blanchett or probably not Kate Blanchett, but someone doing ballet that's made to look like Kate Blanchett. Um, there's like the camera just like, loves dancing um which is something that i didn't know fincher was as interested in but the the way he shoots those scenes like it's just in love with her dancing um it's just it's kind of it's all over the place like and i don't mean that in a bad way i mean that in like it's supposed to be a movie that encompasses the full range of human experience throughout one's life so it's it's gonna some moments are going to be warm and and beautiful and inviting. Some moments are going to be cold and sad. Um, some moments are going to be hopeful. Some moments are gonna, you're you're going to be miserable. And I I don't like. There's no. There are moments where you see Fincher's characteristic grimy coldness, but it's not. It's it's where it's needed. It's not. It doesn't permeate the whole film. Yeah, and even then, I'd say it 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 feels it, it feels different. You know, uh, like like. So right now I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to solve this puzzle because I think it is it is interesting, and the one thing I'm noticing is like Fincher loves Fincher loves to have light sources in the frame. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking at a whole bunch of stills from Fight Club, and, and and then I'm comparing them to a whole bunch of stills from Benjamin Button. And the thing about Fight Club that you notice is that they're like they're either fluorescent lights or they're like they're just very like bright and then the whole the rest of the frame is very dark like that's like the characteristic thing about fight club is it's just like black like like half the frame is black mm. in, in like so many shots in fight club and and then there'll be like a like a, a a light hanging there like a light bulb hanging from a ceiling for example or or various things there's a whole bunch of examples of this and it's just it creates this this huge level of contrast which creates a lot of that feeling of coldness i think Whereas in Benjamin Button, um, there's there's a lot more evenness. There's a lot less contrast. They're like like the if, if there's a dark part of the image and a light part of the image, then like the, the 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 brighter part of the image will seem to maybe glow a bit. But it's not this like this glaring, overpowering light source that that blackens out everything else in the frame. Yeah, it, he uses natural light a lot too. I think it seems like it, especially for the past where there just aren't all these bright light sources indoors um Mm -hmm. or not as much anyway um but yeah i do i do think that's that's the major change particularly between those two movies i mean i mean i think even in zodiac zodiac is also a very dark movie and i mean i mean visually dark um it's a lot of is a lot of it is, is at night um yeah and you know even in this movie the scenes that are at night they kind of have like a uh that there will be like lamps, you know, and uh, yeah, I, I, I it's it's really interesting. It's definitely, um, I, I feel like I have a better handle after after just kind of glancing over these images. I have a better handle over why, like you said, this movie does feel warmer. It just it just feels warmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it it is, and and I I appreciate that. Like that's why that's why I really think this is at least partially Fincher saying, I'm going to do something different and he goes for it. Um, and, and like we've been pretty negative throughout this. I, I think this is a good, a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think there's some really great ideas. We haven't even talked about like, 
how many motifs of things going backwards there are in this movie. Like, like the, I, I, I read up on this cause I was curious. The script did not originally call for it to be filmed in new Orleans and it to center around hurricane Katrina in the wake of Katrina. Uh, Louisiana was doing a bunch of incentivizing of, of film production to like get businesses back to get film movies back in new Orleans. And so they got, I think $28 million from the state to film in new Orleans, um, which was pretty key for them because this was a very expensive movie because of all the CG stuff. So, and then they kind of shaped the movie around that in, in really interesting ways, not only bringing Katrina into it, but just bringing new Orleans into, uh, Benjamin Button's life, which is this, this fascinating, like melting pot community type thing. Um, and, and I really appreciated that, but yeah, but, the, because it's a hurricane hurricanes spin counterclockwise matt so that's part of the going against the clock um there's this this recurring hummingbird motif throughout this entire movie the hummingbird is the only bird that can fly backwards so it's kind of like going through this like this thing is different from all the other things it's going in the wrong direction or yeah. a different direction rather i like that i didn't notice those those particular things i mean this mm-hmm. the, the i mean yeah obviously the hummingbird becomes a symbol of um moving on i would say because first the hummingbird is the symbol for the the irish guy um but then it sort of just becomes the symbol for for death and moving on and and uh, uh yeah i i i like that i like all that stuff i like i like, I like a lot of the side characters quite a lot yeah. actually yeah, I mean, all the vignettes, I think, were great. The the tugboat captain, like his uh, Benjamin Button's conversation with the tugboat captain, where he goes on his his monologue about that he's an artist. Uh-huh. And um, like his my dad says, <laughs> my dad says, you have to be a tugboat captain. And I say, no, I'm an artist. And he this, this rousing monologue rips his shirt off, shows his tattoos. <laughs> and the end of it is. But you're a tugboat captain. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really well constructed moment. It really works. Um, the same thing with with this whole love affair with um, Elizabeth played by um, uh, we already talked about it. Now, I can't remember her name. Tilda. Oh. Tilda Swinton. Thank yeah. you. Um, this whole love affair he has in it's in Russia and it's just the, the hotel that they're hanging out is just this beautiful construction. Like this is a hotel that you wish you could visit and just i i watched those scenes together and i wanted to be up in the middle of the night hanging out in a hotel um and and it's it's so amazing to me like just tricks of filmmaking every time he sees elizabeth he's in each and every one of these rooms with her and the rooms feel alive and warm and lived in and then at the very end when she disappears and he can't find her um he walks he basically goes through every room that they were in together while walking through um this hotel and spending time together and they they feel cold and awful like it's so it's so it's fascinating to me how they're in they're in russia in the winter and um it's fucking freezing (laughs) yeah and yet this hotel was this place of warmth and and life as these two people talk to each other and then uh, it's like as soon as she left the the cold from the outside came in and i thought like it's just beautiful direction there. Yeah, I, really I like I like how it even goes with the script because um, she, you know, hearing hearing the diary, she says, "I'm just glad he had someone to keep him warm." Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is which is really really cool. It um, is really cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it's these little things where I'm like, I I I love Tilda Swinson's character, and I love that she goes back and finishes her swim across the English Channel when she's when she's older. Um, but that's one of those things where it's like, well, this what, what does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> what, what does it mean it, it's a very forrest gump scene where it's like and and then and then this happened and you're like yeah okay well i mean i like his conversation with her was her at, like in her 50 i don't know she, she was an be, age yeah 40s <laughs> yeah 40s 50s she, she was full of regrets yeah she's full of regrets she's disillusioned with her life and she finds in this man like a kindred spirit of a sort. And I think there's an irony there because he's like 18 years old. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so she like is able to express all this stuff to him. And I guess, I mean, to your point, like there is nothing in their time together that leads you to believe that the reason she decided to swim the English channel again is because of her interaction with Benjamin button. Right. Like there, yeah. if, if that's what the story was going for, I didn't, I don't think it, 
succeeded in that. But I don't think that's what the story was going for. Like, I don't think the point is here. I don't think the point is that Forrest Gump, like Benjamin Button, touches all these people's lives and then they go on to do cr- crazy, amazing things. Like, I just don't think that's what the movie is. I think just the movie is a man wandering through his life and seeing people and then seeing the choices they make at at different points. Like, yeah, he he sees her and he's like, oh, look, she's years older now and she found herself that's good that makes me feel good she finally did something she finally did it yeah right it's it, it does work i guess with the with the ideas of, of like aging in reverse because when, when he's young when he's young he sees all of the mistakes that elderly people make and he sees all of their regrets and he and he decides i'm i'm not gonna live such that i have regrets mm-hmm. and, um, and then he does it anyway because that's because that's how life works. <laughs> I, I, I guess I like that. Yeah, I, I do like that because part of you is like, oh, the movie's going to be about him seeing seeing the regrets old people have and then, and then using that to live his life better. But like he he just sort of makes a different sort of mistakes, like in a, like like his own special, unique sort of mistakes uh, and ends up with his own special, unique sort of regrets. Um, it, it's really I mean, it's funny because it's like it's a it's a tragedy. It's a it's a tragedy, right? Like it, it's definitely a tragedy, but the movie leaves you with a kind of a wistful, positive feeling. Yeah. I mean, it's a tragedy in just the way that all life is like, it just, that's just how the cookie crumples baby. <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I don't know. I guess. I mean, I, it definitely, uh, yeah. I, like, it, like at least Forrest Gump, ends with him having his son and no Forrest Gump ends with the only person who tried to make something of her life dying of AIDS. <laughs> That's how Forrest Gump ends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. But he has his son though. So there's sure. hope. Whereas this is just everyone dies. The end. Well, but everyone dies That's though. Tr- yeah. But, <laughs> but it matters. <laughs> I, I think okay. Th- this is this is my problem. Yes, everyone dies, but it matters what you left behind. And what he left behind was a legacy of a daughter who didn't know him because he made a stupid choice. Yeah, but what does what does Kate Blanchett say at the very end of the movie where she says, "I wish I had known him"? She says, "You do now." No, she doesn't. She just read his diary. I mean, that's him, man. What do you want? Do you, we do watched you, the movie. Do you feel like you know Benjamin it, Button now? No. I mean, uh, I, 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 I get that you're joking. For you. <laughs> I, I get that you're joking. <laughs> it's it, you. I, I mean that like that that joke gives the like destroys the whole premise of the movie though because it's like no like you can't compare your relationship with your parent to like reading five pages of of diary entries that they wrote. No, certainly not. Yeah. It's more than five pages, but so, but. <laughs> <laughs> five pages five pages no 30 pages, pages maybe yeah well we're talking yeah no I, I i totally agree i i think i think in the same way that every person at the end of their life is looking back on their life and looking at the regrets they've made and and writing uh their uh, uh a biography of their life um sh- i really do think caroline his daughter will read that diary and it will change her life in certain ways like i I do think she will live a different life maybe that's just me being optimistic and hopeful like the legacy he left for her is look i lived this curious life this weird backwards life i did everything the opposite of the way i should have done it and i learned some stuff and here's all the stuff i learned and may that help you live a better life. May that help you make the choices that I didn't. May that help you find the strength to start all over again. If you're ever in a place in your life when you're not satisfied, where you're on with, you're unhappy. Uh-huh. Um, that's the movie to me. I like that between the two of us, we'll, we'll, we, we hate, we hate one Eric Roth movie and, and, and then defend the <laughs> other, but, but we disagree about which. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I don't hate this movie. There's, there's so much good in it. I just, mm-hmm. I, I so strongly disagree with this this theme that it makes it really hard for me. Um, sure, sure. sure. I, I, I I love I love so many individual scenes though. Yeah, and this because of Fincher again. So great job, David Fincher. Yeah, I mean, I really do think he takes what would have been just a eh, 
movie and elevates it to something that's pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. That I, I enjoyed watching. I I, I want to talk about the acting a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I, I like Brad Pitt a lot. We've talked a lot about Brad Pitt and his strengths and weaknesses. I wonder if he was miscast here uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I don't like I think he does a serviceable job in this movie, but I just don't feel like this is the type of role like I know it's fun because Brad Pitt's like a beautiful man. And, and so seeing him age backwards is like, man, wow. Uh-huh. But I just don't know if he has. I don't even know how to describe it. Well, first of all, his accent is not good because Brad Pitt is, bless his heart, not very good at accents. Um, I could not stop thinking of his character from Inglorious Bastards anytime he opened his mouth. Like, I just couldn't think of him not uh, saying, Gorlam. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I just, every time he opened his mouth, like every <laughs> single time. Um, uh, yeah. But I, I, I almost wonder if he's like too reserved in this movie like i think we, we've talked about this before brad pitt's at his best when he's at have this like this this kinetic kind of twitchy energy yeah um and, and this is a movie that is almost like it's it's impossible for him to be that character because when he's young in mind his body's old and when he's young in body his mind is old so he can never have that like youthful energy like even when he's a young person in this movie he doesn't move like a young person he doesn't walk like a young person he walks like a person who's seen 60 70 years um and so like i just don't think this movie plays up to his strengths as an actor like it's not he he's charismatic he's he's a star like he's not this kind of character um yeah and i think he does a fine job i just wonder like with a different lead how different this movie works Yes. Um, yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, he, he was, he's amazing in seven. Mm-hmm. He, he, he's almost, uh, I would say he makes fight club, except it's also got Ed Norton and, and, um, and, uh, Helena Bonham Carter and, and, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic movie. Um, this, this, this slow, thoughtful, subtle movie is, is not something that plays to his strengths. Yeah. Well, and it, and it's interesting to me because, I hadn't seen it when this movie came out, but I, I it's 2020 now and I've seen um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which has Brad Pitt doing an older man. It is not his youthful, like twitchy energy type performance, but it is still a quintessential Brad Pitt ish kind of performance. He has the charisma. He has the energy like he's older and a movie is about old men near the end of their careers. But he's still it's that's like it's perfect. And here. I don't know. It just it just didn't work for me. Yeah, it just didn't work. Yeah, right. Um, on, yeah. on the other side of the coin, though, Kate Blanchett was perfect for this role. Absolutely perfect. I think. I think she was everything that this character needed to be. I think she's the thing I love about her her character here is I hated her at certain points and I loved her at other points. And I think I was absolutely supposed to like when he meets her as a young woman. And she's I think it's that montage where like they go to dinner for the first time and Fincher does this really interesting thing where he's like cutting between um, her talking to him and, and the dinner and every and it, it like makes this frantic frenetic like type of pace. And she's so annoying. Uh-huh. <laughs> like she's just like quick talking and is like never letting him talk. And, and she's passionate. But I just was like, this is annoying. I don't like her right now. Yeah. And because she's young. Like that's the thing is she's young. And she's a little conceited. She's a little self-involved. Yeah. Like she's just, that's just that part of her right. stage of growing. Yeah. It, it's the part of her life where she's in New York and New York is, is so awesome. And you, I, you definitely want to hear everything about New York. Right. Like I've, right. I've met this person. Yes. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, she, she, she perfectly nails the, um, you know, the energy of whatever age she is being, whether it's, 19 or 50 i i think i i think yeah i, I agree she she does beautifully um yeah at, 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 i mean just across the board every, every yeah. scene the only in fact the only criticism is super super old kate blanchett in the hospital bed obviously obviously fake super obviously fake yeah well uh, here's the thing about it. i feel like I don't know. I, 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 our voices are going to change when we get older, right? Especially when we're on our deathbed. 
But I, I, I feel like movies try to play that up too much where like she's clearly trying to do like a type thing. And I just don't I just I didn't that felt over the top. Yeah, it, was, to me. it was a bit it was a bit over the top. I mean, like the one thing I noticed is like um, her her mouth doesn't move mm-hmm. like at all. Like like she'll be talking and her mouth doesn't move. And it's just yeah, that's not I, I immediately immediately noticed that, that that kind of thing. Sure. Um, but really everything except everything except that. Um, yeah, I was I was into it. I think my favorite my favorite part of this entire movie is when uh, Ben has decided to leave and he's like packed all the money like he puts all the money in the trust and he's like his thing is to like to leave it on her nightstand and then just disappear in the night and he he bends over to put it on the nightstand and fincher shoots this so amazingly because brad pitt straightens up after bending over and you're just bam on Kate blanchett's eyes she's just wide awake just staring at him as he like leaves his goodbye note and and so he fincher's constructed a scene now where we force benjamin button to silently walk out of the room with her just giving him this like full-eyed like anger this perfectly acted anger and disappointment um where she knows exactly what he's doing and she knows why but she's just furious with him i thought that was just like that like no moment in this movie made me like kind of catch myself a little bit like oh shit yeah and and i thought it was just it was perfect it was perfect fincher is so good when he's on his game like he really is i agree i mean that that look is is in the dictionary under accusing stare Uh, yeah it it was amazing i i i had the same reaction i'm glad that you i'm glad you brought that up actually Mm -hmm. I, i do think there's something interesting and I, I honestly, I, I'd seen this movie before, but it had been so long, I didn't necessarily remember how it went. And and there seemed to be like this natural conflict that is created between this couple that is she is a dancer who was injured and is resentful of his youth. Like that just seemed to be where we were going, right? Like she's this beautiful young dancer and she like as having a career in it, which is like so fucking rare in dance. Oh my God. Like to get to where she got, it's incredible. Like it's one in a million. And then she hurts her leg, can never dance again. And then she's watching herself age that one scene where she's swimming in the swimming pool and just sees that younger woman doing laps and then get out of the pool. And it's like completely dialogue free, but you, you get everything she's thinking in that moment. And then she's married to a man who gets younger every day. And I, I there's some real great conflict to mine from that concept. And I thought it was interesting that the movie kind of just waved it away a little bit. Like she's feeling that way. He kind of says, he, he kind of says something that's true, but probably not the best thing to say in the moment, which is, you know, you picked a career that only had a really short window anyway. Like even if you weren't hurt, your career would be over by now anyway, which is like (laughs) not, not very comforting. (laughs) Uh Um, And then she's just like, I think like we go cut to a new scene. And then she says to him, it's like, I'm, she just says, I'm never going to be that person again. I'm never going to be resentful and spiteful. Uh, I'm just never going to be that person. And then the movie's like, okay, cool. We did it. Um, And I wonder, like, I just I wonder if a different version of the movie really dives into that conflict in an interesting way or or maybe helps define part of his reason for leaving was because his fear of her that she would grow to resent him as he got younger and younger and younger as well. Like like it wasn't just about the kid. It was about both of them. Yeah, I'm, pr- um, I'm pretty annoyed at how much sense that makes <laughs> um, because. I think, you know, I don't mean for this to keep going back to Forrest Gump, but it does remind me of a quality of the characters of this writer is that like their lives just kind of swing randomly between different epochs without, without connection or like, like, like everyone's, everyone is sort of constantly reacting to the accrued life experiences that they have and, both good and bad tra- traumas and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, you, you, you create goals because of experience that happened to you, you create fears and characters in this movie. I, I feel like they just kind of, 
and then and then he did this yeah and then not, she not- did this and there's there's not a lot of connective tissue and and like even on a right like that's that's on a human level i think what you were describing was like on a on a writing level on on the level of like story economy and just writing a writing a good script yeah that <laughs> that, that should have like like the dancing thing should have like mattered in some way mm-hmm. man you're so right about this i mean i'm thinking about forrest gump as a character and benjamin button as a character yeah and how similar they are as human beings yeah like let me ask you a question what does benjamin button want what I, does he want i don't know like yeah he he's literally a person that's just drifting through life i mean he's sitting by the side of a a, a river one morning uh-huh. and some guy says hey we need another person yeah for this tugboat and he's like i'm bored i'll do it right and then um and then, like, so he just becomes a, a tugboat yeah. man. And then they catch a lot of shrimp because the hurricane destroyed <laughs> all the other tugboats. Well, but, like, yeah, there's never a moment where the movie, like, defines what he wants out of his life. Like, what does he want to do? What does he want to accomplish? Where does he want to go? And why? Like, it's just, he's just kind of going along with it. Like, yeah. when he leaves on his 17th birthday to leave, like, it's just... It's just the movie just like, well, that's because it's time to do that now. It's like, why does he want to go right. see the world? Why does he want to go do these things? Like he, he's, he meets his father. His father dies and leaves him the button factory. What is he doing then? Like, wh- what are they doing? What are they doing for money? Are they just living off of that fortune? Yeah. Like, like, what do you want to right. do? What do you want to accomplish in your life? And it's never defined. Like hers is like with Jenny <laughs> in Forrest Gump. <laughs> Her goals are clearly defined and the movie rips them away from her. Uh-huh. Of course they do. Um, cause all the women in this, this author's <laughs> a movie, just their goals right. are smashed well, and they don't ever and, get them ever. And, and they're hopelessly, they're hopelessly in love with a man who displays no admirable qualities <laughs> <laughs> and just gets rich, rich through circumstance. Yeah. Yeah. Like right. Forrest just happens to be the only fishing boat and, Benjamin just happens to be the heir of a rich button manufacturer. Right. And, 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 oh my God. And, and they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're men who these women met when they were little girls Fuck. And, and didn't have any discernment or ability to like know what they wanted in a man. Oh no. I think I have to hate this now. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. It's exactly the same. Yeah. Cause it's yeah. true. Like wh- why is she attractive? Why does she love Benjamin button? Yeah. He's, because he's curious. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Be, be, because she remembers him fondly from her childhood. That's it. Uh-huh. Like yeah. he, he's not, he's not great. <laughs> he doesn't seem particularly interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He just kind of quietly observes the world, which is cool. Like I wish I was a quiet observer of the world, but I don't know if I want to hang out with a quiet observer of the world. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean like by design, every, 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 every other character that he's interacting with is more interesting than him. Yes. Yes. In wow. This is this has been a uh, end to this conversation that I was not expecting. <laughs> but I, and, and I think so when I look at this, I have to say, what is the difference between Forrest Gump and Benjamin Button? Why do I like one more? And the answer has to be David Fincher. The answer answer has to be the way he constructs his movie, the way he directs it, the, the style, the look, the feel of the movie is just something that is infinitely more palatable to me than I guess the Robert Zemeckis version. Cause that's Forrest Gump was Robert Zemeckis, right? I don't know. I believe so. Uh, I had that looked up a second ago, but, but no longer. Yes. It's Zemeckis. Yeah. Um, Sounds right. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, the end on Benjamin button. I mean, so like, do you, is there any other connective tissue to Fincher films you see in this thing besides, the fact that it doesn't connect to to any other film in Fincher's films, like, oh, uh, you know, the, uh, one thing that I did want to point out is like we we did mention this um this theme across his works of like people trying to find their purpose and being lost, mm-hmm. and and Benjamin Button sort of qualifies for that, but like, but it doesn't. He doesn't find it. <laughs> it, it, it right, like it, it sort of vaguely tangentially deals with this theme, but not in the like effective and clear way like like there's no morgan freeman turning at the last moment and saying i'll be around right like Mm -hmm. like the in all those movies alien 3 finds her purpose in sacrificing herself i guess morgan freeman finds his purpose in in you know yes it sucks but i can't give up on this place fight club the narrator 
realizes that he has to he has to have a human connection with someone. Yeah, I mean, I mean, social network deals with it too. We'll talk about that, at the, you know, later on. Mm-hmm. This movie, uh, he's he, he fumbles around his whole life, falls in love, but then fucking abandons her for no reason. The last shot of this movie, Matt. The last shot of this movie is the backwards clock that the man who lost his son in World War One built to remind the world that uh, time is fleeting. And we wish we could go back and undo our mistakes and and bring back the people that we have lost lost, but we can't. The movie says we can't. But this is a, this is almost a reminder to cherish the memory, cherish the moments. The movie ends with this clock having been replaced, shoved into a back room, and being flooded by the levees breaking in, in, oh my in God. New Orleans. And That's Katrina. such a depressing image. <laughs> I couldn't believe that was the end of the movie. Actually, I was mm-hmm. like, what? <laughs> like, She's dead, and now the clock is getting destroyed by Katrina. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, God. It does. I mean, like, uh, we've talked about how Katrina was a good backdrop for this movie in, in a lot of the themes, but it is certainly a, a a dour one because, like, we know what happens in Katrina. It's a disaster. It's devastating. Yeah. So many people die. People lose their homes. Like, the New Orleans is irrevocably changed. They're still like there are still abandoned buildings in new Orleans everywhere from Katrina. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting that this, this movie kind of about loss and, and death, but also about like experience ends on that dower of a, a note. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I don't know, man. I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is some Fincher into it. Do you think like part of me wonders if, Eric Roth like wrote the script and it was like it was like super it was like Forrest Gump and then Fincher gets in and is like no we got to end this thing fucking sad as shit yeah I don't know Fincher doesn't talk like that but that's my Fincher voice now no we got to fucking this is gonna be depressing as fuck yeah the clock oh you built a clock I'm gonna fucking flood it yeah there's probably nothing in the script about about the clock being replaced and then and then the floodwaters <laughs> crashing in through the station at the end yeah everything is pointless everyone dies smoke cigarettes the end but hey i got to be on a tugboat (laughs) i got to i got to fight in world war ii that was a story that i got to tell later i got to bang a spy's wife yeah on the eve of world war ii yeah i got i got thanked by a prostitute um, how did he know how did Benjamin Button know that that man was a spy is that like a real are these real moments in history uh, that's just yeah that seems like a very Forrest Gump moment where it's like um, well, I got to meet the president yeah I, again I, it, it's it's sort it's a pretty extraneous detail honestly yeah well, but, or, well maybe I mean, she part, told him though I don't know uh, yeah maybe she did tell him I don't know part of me is wondering like the, this movie is a lot less explicit with it than Forrest Gump is, but part of me is wondering, like, are these things that are happening, like, r- real moments in time? Like, I'm looking it up right now because I'm looking up to see if Elizabeth Abbott is a real person. The the woman who swam the English Channel? Yes. I mean... Uh, no. Okay. No. There is an Elizabeth Abbott that has a Wikipedia entry, <laughs> but she did not swim the English Channel. Okay. She was not around. She was born in 1942, so not going to work. So, yeah, no, that wasn't it wasn't Forrest Gumpy in that. Like, look, this is a real life thing that happened. I mean, there was a woman that swam the English Channel. I mean, presumably a woman hasn't done that. <laughs> I don't know. The, the oldest woman to swim the English Channel uh, was 71 when she did it. I wonder if that was the inspiration for Elizabeth Abbott. It probably was the inspiration for this whole movie. I don't know if it was the whole movie. Okay, let's stop talking about Benjamin Button. Okay. Um, an okay movie. Um, I would definitely, if I had to rank them, and we're not really doing this, but if I had to rank them, I would probably put this near the bottom. Uh, yeah, of, I, I, I don't think I would put any of these movies below it. So, yes. And, yes, I'm including Alien 3 in that. I mean, Alien 3 fucking owns, so yeah. I have no qualms in that. The one I wasn't sure about was the game, but uh, I think I do like the game better than this movie. I forgot about the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, that I, I don't feel the need to rank too too badly, but yeah, I, I, I thought this movie was... Well, I, think, I think you said it perfectly. This movie's good, right? It's better than mm-hmm. fine. It's not great. 
Yeah, yeah. And any other director, I think, makes a worse movie. Yeah, so yeah. that's a testament to the skill of our director. So, yes. So that is it for The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I believe the next movie on our list is the one you alluded to a little bit earlier, Matt, The Social Network, which yep. is a movie that I love. And if we have a problem with scripting in this movie... Don't think we're going to have that problem when Aaron Sorkin gets behind the computer. I so, suspect you're right. Um, I am. I can't wait to talk about that movie. I love. I love that movie. I think that was on my list of one of the best movies of the decade. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. We'll be back a little bit later next month to talk about the Social Network. All right, Matt. It's it's war. <laughs> it's war. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the state of cinema right now um of course we all know that coronavirus has shut down movie theaters no no movie theaters in the world i don't know if that if that's true but no, certainly not in the united states are showing movies right now um and things are starting to open back up uh stupidly my state of texas is doing that probably way earlier than they should but one thing that's happened is some companies like universal have decided to put movies directly on VOD. Um, the big movie they did that with is Trolls World Tour, starring the McElroys. Um, it went directly to VOD on the day it was supposed to release in theaters. And actually, Matt, it did quite well. Um, it raked in over $100 million in three weeks, being uh, for sale or for rent on VOD for a $20 price. Um, which actually beats the theatrical release numbers for the first movie, like completely. Um, the whole theatrical run of the first movie was under a hundred dollars domestic, a hundred million dollars domestically. So it beats that. So earlier this week, Universal bragged about that because they were like, "Look at this! Look, at, look, it, it did good." Um, and AMC, the uh, the theater chain company, uh, they lost their minds a little bit about that, and they basically said. We're not going to show any more Universal films in our theaters ever. <laughs> that is going to the mattresses, isn't it? <laughs> it, it really is. That's, it really you, is. You're just like, that is a, that is a, uh, from the hip play. Like, yeah. like who, who is making the calls at this, at this corporation? Right. Well, I mean, I, like there, there's a lot of complicated things in the, in this, this story, actually. I mean, the first is that, the Trolls World Tour numbers look good, but not like you got to think about the fact that if there wasn't a national uh, a worldwide pandemic, um, Trolls World Tour would have released in theaters, maybe done this well, maybe done a hundred million dollars. Then it would have had a home video release that also would have raked in more money. Um, so, so the idea that that like they've they've still lost a a revenue stream, right? Yeah. Like not having theaters is still taking a revenue stream away. Now the hope is theoretically, if, if you're a, a movie company right now that you can actually eventually the revenue, the theater revenue stream doesn't make sense anymore because we're doing so well with this VOD stuff and companies like AMC are justifiably terrified about that. They are, they, that is the death of them. Um, they cannot exist if if a company like Universal says, hey, this model might actually be profitable for us and we don't need you anymore. So they reacted about as extreme as they could because they want to send a message. And the message is. Like, if you keep fucking around with this stuff, we're not we're not going to deal with you like and. It, it hasn't flipped like the idea that Fast and Furious nine next summer is not going to play in a movie theater would be devastating for Universal. It would be absolutely devastating. I think they're they're bluffing. Like I think that this this whole thing is just negotiating in the press, right? Like yes. they're just they're just arguing via headlines. They are they are bluffing, but it's a weird bluff. Let like like why do that? It sounds crazy. Yeah, it's the problem is it's so crazy that you just don't believe it. Yeah, because they're not going to do that. They, they, they're not going to they're not going to not do business with their number one, uh, not not literally number one, but one, one of their one of their top business partners, because that business partner is entertaining the thought of opening other revenue streams and doing things differently. Like yeah, that's yeah. that's a 
they're, they're not. I will bet you money they're not going to do that. Yeah, so, I mean, what they're going to do is renegotiate the deal of the theater stuff. Like, in light, in light of you also wanting to do VOD, we're going to renegotiate. But, like, <laughs> it's just a mess. It's just a total mess. Because Universal is not the last company that's going to be doing this. Like, a bunch of other ones are looking at doing the same thing. And I think the funny thing is, when Universal first announced that they were going to do this with do this with Trolls World Tour, all the movie theater companies were like, all right, we get it. Like, you want to show your movie. There's no place to show your movie right now. So we get it. And they didn't get angry at them about this whole thing. And then they released their numbers. And then AMC went ballistic. Yeah, because like just the idea that this could be a profitable enterprise is the worst possible move the worst possible future for a, a movie theater company. Uh huh. But, but like, but, but look, AMC, I'm speaking directly to you, AMC, (laughs) like, like universal's not going to, or sorry, Cinemark's not going to not allow their movies. And in in fact, if you, if AMC, if you cut off universal and I want to go see a universal movie in the theaters, I'm going to go to your competitor. Who's going to, who could even justify charging higher prices. Like, you're not you're they're just not going to do that so yeah I, it's just it's just a bizarre it's just a bizarre posturing move i mean it's the kind of bizarre posturing move that you make when you're desperate honestly and and i think that that's maybe the interesting thing to me about it is it really shows how back against the wall they actually are um yeah yeah and and how I, things are definitely going to move in some in some big way i think i will say that regal one of the other big chains made a, a similar announcement not quite as as um as crazy as amc's but they said um that regal is not boycotting universal nor any other studio we will continue our normal policy and play movies that respect the theatrical window allowing movies to be released first in theaters prior to streaming or vod platforms so basically they're not changing their policy but they are saying that if they start doing day and date VOD releases, they're not, they don't want, they don't want to be in that business. Um, uh-huh. I just, I, I think you're right that I just don't know what leverage they have in that regard. Um, but I mean, they were mad like the, the Cineworld CEO, which is what Regal is owned by, um, said they, they said that the universal decision to bypass the theatrical window for trolls world tour was completely inappropriate. It certainly has nothing to do with good faith, business practices, partnership and transparency. So they're mad at each other. They're ma- they're mad. And I just don't know. I just like if I'm universal, I'm just like, we have all the cards. Yeah. Like, I, I just like, right. what are you going to what are you going to do? Yeah. But, I mean, are, using words like like um, uh, partnership and transparency, it's like it's not a partnership. Yeah. You you it's to your advantage to frame it as a partnership. You are. um you you are a, a I'm trying I'm trying to figure out are they the client or are they the um it yeah it, it it's not it's not a partnership it's it's mm-hmm. a business relationship which which in this particular case has become contentious because one of the one of the business parties has realized that they can make more money by doing something that definitely hurts the other party but like that's that's business baby it's mm-hmm. gonna happen. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I will say that the National Association of Theater Owners, which is a um like a a trade organization that's basically it's not like a they I don't think they can collectively bargain or anything, but it is a pretty powerful group in negotiating. It's basically all the theater owners across the country band together to to um not set per, not do anything shady, but just to negotiate like deals um but like distribution deals and that kind of stuff. So they're like, so they do have some power in that regard that they could do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I don't, I I don't, I look, I love movie theaters. Movie theaters are amazing. I love watching movies in movie theaters. I, I have not been to the theater since this whole thing started and I miss it so much. They're in trouble. They're in trouble. Um, this is one of those things where, I think the writing's been on the wall as far as theater versus VOD for a while now. And it's just 
nobody um nobody had the balls to try it because the risk was so high like if you if you tell me like take your big temple movie and just just put it on vod no one's gonna say yes to that because that's insane no you have to release it in theaters it's a big temple movie but if you have to now because of coronavirus you can you're you you're like you are much more able to fail, right? Like you have, you have so much more leeway to take these kind of risks and they've now found that this thing's kind of profitable. Yeah, um, e- e- exactly. Like the, the executive who makes the call to, Hey, uh, l- let's, let's just release this one on VOD. And then, and then they, then the company loses $50 million. That executive is fired mm-hmm. immediately. But yes, this accidentally happened. And, and now you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it just it all kind of reminds me of of like the oil cartel dynamics, where like extremely powerful people literally collude to set oil prices, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, in public, and it works for a while until it stops working because some some underlying dynamic changes, and that's, that's what it reminds me of when you tell me like, yeah, yeah, well, like like they they have an organization that they 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 have some bargaining power. Well, they have some bargaining power until the counterparty decides nah we're still gonna do it this way <laughs> and, and then they suddenly don't have any bar- bargaining power anymore you know right so. yeah 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 i mean we'll see where all this goes i i i don't i don't know like again amc is gonna show universal movies they're going to once the movie theaters open up again once we all start going to the theater again uh universal movies will be at amc i have no doubt about that in my mind but this is a shift. This is a change. Like, the, like we've talked about many times how the world is not going to look the same on the other side of this whole thing. And I think theaters are one place with, that the industry was already suffering, already having a tough time. And this has pushed is sped up that, that, uh, inevitability by a lot. Um, yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen, but the, we're going to have a lot more fights, a lot more bitching at each other in the trades, in the future this is just what's going to continue to happen yeah I, I i agree i think i agree with your assessment completely oh boy i just want to go to the movies i just want to go to a movie and watch a new movie and be like oh it's so great to be in this theater and i don't have to worry about getting sick or anything I when when can i have that back 2022 okay <laughs> well that is it we have that is all we had for you guys this week. If you have opinions on anything we talked about today, feel free to reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or on Twitter at doofmedia. Why is Benjamin Button better than Forrest Gump? Email us and let us know. <laughs> or vice versa. No, uh, impossible. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And you can find this and all of our shows over at our website, doofmedia.com. And hey, do we got something special for you folks right now? Because if you're listening to this the day it came out, which is May 1st, tonight at 9.30 Central Time, the first episode of the Doof Game Club is live on our YouTube channel. So if you have followed us for any amount of time, you know that we do a monthly book club where Matt and I read a book. We meet with you guys on the last Friday of the month and talk about what we liked about the book, what we didn't like. We talk about the themes. We analyze it. We just chat about the book for a while. Well, our friends at MediaMD and part of the Doof Network decided that they want to do something similar to that, but with video games. So today, right tonight, 930, YouTube, they're going to be talking about the first game in the Doof Game Club, Hollow Knight, the Metroidvania Hollow Knight. Um, and I've been playing this game all week, and I'm super, super excited to see what this conversation is like. Me too. Yeah, uh, I have not been playing it, but I still really, I, I've actually been watching you play it on Twitch. And <laughs> and yeah, I, I'm looking forward to hearing people who really know about game design, like they do, uh, dig into it in ways that I don't even have the language to describe yeah uh, my my extension my knowledge of games is this is fun i it's, yeah. it's fun i'm bad at them uh, but i like them yeah so that will once again check out our youtube channel and you will see them go live uh, it's open to everyone everyone can come and hang out and chat about hollow knight and the voting for next month's video game is happening right now on our patreon so 
if you like what we do here and you want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. That's patreon.com slash Doof Media. You can pledge just $1, $1, and that gives you access to be able to vote in next month's game club. So you want to you wanna tell us what video game you want Ruben and Elliot to share their knowledge about? You can do that right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, uh, please consider rating and reviewing the Doofcast on Apple Podcasts because every review helps us to get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make here. All right, folks, that is it for us this week. We will see you all next week when we talk about one of Matt's favorite movies of all time. We're talking about Vin Diesel's Pitch Black. Damn right. And you'll do what I say. Woo, woo. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Woo.